I would like you to consider these two photographs for a moment. Now imagine that they were part of a charity campaign, asking you to donate 10 euros to making the world a better place. And these pictures show how this charity will spend your money. Which charity would you choose? Obviously, this is a bit of a silly question, because everybody's going to choose Charity One. I mean, I would. Look at these cute schoolgirls in their new uniforms. Your 10 euros can definitely make their lives a lot better. And nobody's going to choose Charity Two, because that picture looks like the boring office meetings you might have yourself from time to time. Your choice is understandable. Like I said, I would also go for Charity One. But the thing I want to tell you about today is that we shouldn't. And I learned that when I went to this place, Haiti. Because in Haiti, I met this man, Laurent. Now, Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And Laurent lives here in one of the slums of the capital, Port-au-Prince. Laurent's walls are made of tarpaulins and his roof of corrugated iron. He owns no proper shoes. Often he's only able to feed his children one meal a day. Now I should tell you that I'm a journalist and I travel all over the developing world to write the stories of people like Laurent. Because I want to help create a world where no one has to live like this. And so I asked Laurent what I often ask people. What do you need most? What would be the number one thing that would significantly improve your life? In other words, I asked him, what charity should we donate our 10 euros to? Now, what I expected him to say was something that resonated with this image of Charity One, of the cute schoolgirls. I expected him to ask for education for his children or a better house, more food maybe, or decent job, free healthcare perhaps, or who knows, that pair of proper shoes. But I was dead wrong. Laurent named none of these things. And instead, the answer he gave me was a complete surprise to me. Now, even more surprising was the fact that I kept getting this same answer over and over again as I interviewed other slum dwellers. These people, who are among the poorest in the world, did not ask for a better house, more food, or a decent job. They did not want, or at least their biggest priority was not, our mosquito nets or our school uniforms, What they wanted, above anything else, was a land registry. A land registry. What they wanted was a place where they could register the land they built their shack on to ensure that it was legally theirs. They wanted to invest in bricks to build proper houses, but they wouldn't do so until they knew for certain that the ground the bricks were standing on would actually remain theirs in the future. They wanted some guarantee that when they spent time and energy cultivating farmland, the harvest could not just be taken away from them by someone claiming to own the land that they farmed. What they wanted, in fact, was some bureaucratic security. What they wanted was this. Now, that came as such a surprise to me that I started to look into this. And I found out that actually, there are many more solutions, like the land registry, that I had never thought about, but that would significantly improve people's lives. Solutions that could really change the world. But there are solutions that you never read about in the media, that you don't hear about in TED Talks, and that you have certainly never donated any money to. And the reason we've never heard about these solutions is very simple. These solutions are all perfectly represented by this image of Charity 2. These solutions, in other words, are all incredibly 
boring. But what I discovered on my journeys is that most of our efforts to change the world fail exactly because we ignore these boring solutions. Most of our efforts or our charities, the solutions that our charities provide, they're based on the image of the cute kids jumping up and down in their school uniforms, but they fail to improve people's lives in the long term. And I'm sure there are people here who think, yeah, okay, aid doesn't work, Africa's still poor, tell me something new. Well, I'm here today to tell you that aid can work, that your donations can make a difference. But that requires us to take a completely different approach. If we want to make this world a better place, we need to take the boring approach. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that school uniforms or blankets for refugees or hospital beds are useless. But what I'm saying is that without also investing in boring solutions, these more appealing solutions will just never work. So brace yourself, because the rest of my talk, it might be boring. I'm going to introduce you to some of the dullest and most yawn-inducing solutions out there that I think are actually the key in the fight against poverty. And there's one word that perfectly sums up all these solutions. Now, that word's also very boring. That word is bureaucracy. So there's this TV commercial from a big Dutch insurance company that pretty much captures the way we view bureaucracy in the West. And I would like to play it for you now. Mijn dochtertje is gisteren haar paarse krokodil vergeten. Paarse krokodil. In blokletters, de juiste locatie voor de vermissing, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in the Netherlands, purple crocodile has come to mean bureaucracy. And bureaucracy is evil. It consumes time and energy and money, not to mention the waste of paper. What the world needs is less bureaucracy, not more, right? Well, that might be true if you live in a country like the Netherlands. But try living in a country that has hardly any bureaucratic system in place. Try living without a land registry, for example, where there's no way to prove that you actually own your house. In those countries, bureaucracy is not bad. It's actually bliss. Consider, for example, living without a proper address. I mean, no street name, no house number, no institution that has registered where you actually live. That might seem like a strange idea to us, but an estimated 4 billion people in the world live without an address. And without that, they're literally off the map. They can't get a bank loan, they can't start a business, they have no voting rights or access to public utility services. So what is the point in building these services with our aid money if four billion people cannot access them? Now, you thought it couldn't get any more boring, but wait for it. Imagine living in a country without a proper tax authority. So in the Netherlands, there's an average of 1.7 tax officials per thousand inhabitants, 1.7 per thousand. In any given sub-Saharan Af sub African country, that average is 0.037 per thousand. So what does that mean? It means that there are trillions of dollars of tax money, trillions of dollars, just waiting to be raised from private citizens in these countries, from multinational companies, but that there are no tax officials to do it. It means that government treasuries are empty and they cannot invest in crucial infrastructure and social services. So for all the beautiful schools and hospitals that our aid money can build, no country will ever be able to run them sustainably in the future without a proper tax authority. 
So while you might want less bureaucracy in your life and fewer purple crocodiles, people in developing countries are actually craving these bureaucratic institutions. They're craving our boring solutions. They're craving charity too, that none of us was going to donate to. Now, I never saw this dichotomy more clearly in practice than when I went to Nepal. I'm sure there are people here who have donated some money to charity after the big earthquake hit Nepal in April 2015. There was massive destruction, and aid agencies, with some of your money, started to rebuild houses and schools and hospitals in a way that was earthquake-proof, that would withstand the next earthquake. And now they celebrate their achievements with images like these, of happy children in beautiful new homes. And I visited some of these charities. But I also visited this man, Ram Kumar Dakal, all alone in his office. We actually had to clear his desk to take this photo because it was all covered in folders and files. Now, this man is responsible for making sure that all the construction in the capital of Nepal happens according to the building code. Now, that building code is actually very good. It requires all the construction to be safe and earthquake-proof. But this man is all alone. How is he ever going to check every building in the city for safe construction? Of course he can't. And no aid agency is helping him. Instead, they all go off and build their own schools and homes. No one is helping this man run a department, because that would just be too boring. Now, it would be unfair to act like aid agencies don't realize this problem. They do. And there's an increasing amount of charities that incorporate some element of what they call capacity building into their programs. Now, in normal language, that means training local people. But the thing is, because capacity building is so boring, and because it's so hard to photograph, I mean, look at this, it's really difficult to gather funds for it. A few years back, a new aid initiative was launched with an incredible name. Tax Inspectors Without Borders. I mean, would you donate? But listen to what they did in Colombia, for example. They started training local tax officials, and um, what they focused on was doing regular audits of multinational companies that operate in the country. Now, in 2011, this is before the training, these audits brought in $3.3 million. In 2014, after the training, they brought in $33 million. That's a tenfold increase in funds that the Colombian government can then spend on developing the country and lifting people out of poverty, just by training some tax officials. Now, the key idea that I want to leave you with today is that saving the world is actually pretty boring. It's not some superhero activity, and most of the time, it does not involve laughing and dancing children. What it does involve is sitting in fluorescent lit rooms and training tax officials, accountants, statisticians, and civil servants. And I hate to break it to you, but when we truly start to take the boring approach and all of us donate to this charity too, chances are we won't be making any headlines. Real philanthropists are not superstars, because in fact, Real progress is also boring. Real progress is Laurent being able to hold in his hand a piece of paper documenting that the land he lives on is actually his. And real progress is Ram Kumar being able to run this whole department checking every building in the city for earthquake-proof construction. Real progress is having boring, boring procedures and loads of purple crocodiles. <laughs> I 
And because saving the world is boring, I hope this talk did not entertain you too much. Thank you very much.